back to the Get a Q podcast. My name is Brandon Hall. I'm pleased to be joined today by Manuel Herrera. He's the coordinator of learning services in the Afton School District, and that is in Afton, Missouri. Is that correct? That is in Afton, Missouri. It's Afton, a, a Missouri. suburb of uh, St. Louis. Like I can throw a rock, and there's the city limits. <laughs> right, right through the gold, right through the gates, right, 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 through, right the- through the gates, man. It's, <laughs> it's right, it's right. I mean, we're neighbors. We have we have different businesses that the kids, you know, at the high school especially sell coupons to. And, you know, the business sometimes are on the other side of the, 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 what is it? The city line. Yeah. We can't even go to that one. We have to go to one on the other side of our town because that's where we, you know, that's where we live or that's uh. where we, they bought it from. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny that we're so close and yet yeah. we can't use some of our stuff over there. It's pretty, pretty funny. So in the shadow of the gateway arch, we speak to Manuel Herrera here. <laughs> uh, he's going to be a featured speaker at the conference coming up for MassQ in February. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. We always have such good talks when we talk. Um, today, we want to talk about a couple of things. But first, we're going to start with uh, with visual thinking. And that is, in my mind, uh, at least what I see from the work that you've done online and, and uh, in your website, uh, ManuelDraws.com, and, and both on Twitter and Instagram, ManuelHerrera33. Uh, you're a shining star, right? On the, on the internet. And you're going to, you're going to say no, but I'm going to say, yes, you are. Uh, but I do want to talk about that and visual thinking and how you help kids you know, use drawing to help communicate in the classroom. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. Thank you. That's a star. Wow. I like that. That's kind of cool. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it was, it's something kind of using drawing in as, as a kid, as when I was a kid, I, I did a lot of drawing. Like it was a lot, for art- artistic value, just kind of doodling. But then it kind of started to trickle into like note taking and kind of just thinking through ideas. And it was just something that I did, you know, naturally. Nobody told me to do it, asked me to do it, said anything about it other than like, well, other than don't do it because it wasn't like traditional note taking or it wasn't traditional way of thinking through a problem. And, um, you know, that's where I, it kind of started. But I, it, I had to tuck it away for quite some time until. I was in schools and once I was back in schools um, and working with kids again, I, I started to see that stuff kind of come out again when just like trying to explain something to students or trying to like understand what a student was thinking. Um, I would just grab, you know, grab a pencil and a piece of paper and kind of just start to draw. And when I, and when I say draw, this is kind of always an interesting conversation when I talk with teachers. Um, when I say draw, I don't necessarily mean I'm drawing something, you know, detailed or artistically. I'm just trying to visualize something that they're saying. So if they're describing something, I'm trying to create that. Or if there's a concept that has multiple parts, maybe I'm trying to lay that out in a way that I can I can kind of see it all at one time and then write in the details. Um, so yeah, like working with kids, um, probably I guess about seven, eight years ago when I was working at a high school, um, I started to have kids come to me because at the time I was – I'm a technology coordinator. And so I had all the gadgets. I had all the 3D printers and laser etchers, poster printers. And so, you know, when kids were assigned projects that required tech, you know, they'd come to me, they'd come to my room, say, hey, Herrera, we need to use, you know, such and such. And I kind of, it was, it was kind of frustrating because, you know, the kids would ask to use this stuff and then, you know, we'd do it. I'd let them, and I focused on teaching them how to use a 3D printer, how to use a poster printer. Um, But what I found was like quality of stuff that they were creating uh, <laughs> wasn't good. It just wasn't good at all. And I was like, man, these, I mean, these guys are in high school. They have, you know, everything at their fingertips, whether it's information, guidance, something, why does this look like the quality of stuff when I was a kid? You know, I graduated 1996, you know, and so I didn't have anything, but yet it was pretty comparable to what we were creating then. And so a particular group came in and, and we sat and started talking about a, a 3D print. And what I realized was that they really didn't have like a, a, as a group, they didn't have this idea really thought through. They had no idea what they wanted to create, what they wanted to design. And so um, I kind of just drew, naturally just drew it as, as they were saying it. And and then they started to point like, hey, well, yeah, well, that's what we want to do. We kind of want to draw that or we want to create this or whatever. And they kind of contributed to the contributed to the drawing. And I was like, okay, so this is what it is. Like, they don't know what they want to create. They don't know what they want to design. And so um, it kind of it kind of went from there. So like, let me help kids visualize a physical product. Like, that's where I started a lot of the kind of re- re- looking back at this. Started a physical product. What can I create? Um, and 
that worked well. I mean, it was great because there's, you know, when you're trying to create a product of some sort with the group, everybody has an idea, right? Everybody's got um, their input and that just helps people to kind of just see what it is we're trying to create. Then it, it kind of trickled into other projects. So it would come into um, videos would be another big oh. <laughs> project at high school, man. <laughs> Video, I'm, video I'm, creation. I'm, I'm and, sitting in our green screen. Go ahead. I'm sitting in our green screen room right now. <laughs> our listeners can't see it, but you can see it in our video chat here. And the number of times I've looked through the door, we have a glass window in the door, so we can, you know, so the kids, we know the kids know that we know we're watching and they're watching and we know. <laughs> right. The number of times I've seen them stand here and go, okay, now how do we want to do this? Like they have a script, but they don't have an action plan for the script, right? Like the. If you were to look at like a real movie script, there'd be, you know, uh, you know, here's what the scene, the description of the scene first and how they're going to shoot it and everything else. And the direct the job of the director is to is to direct. Uh, they have no idea how to do that. Yeah, I mean, it's it's so true. And yet we we assign kids videos all the time, all the time in classes, I mean, from, you know, kindergarten all the way up. But you're exactly right. You've been in that situation. You've oh. seen those kids like thoroughly confused thoroughly confused great ideas just where do i start what's the next step and so you know we started getting into storyboard like something that's as simple as storyboarding so um how is this gonna yours even had a script that's you're already you're already like on your way at least our kids were like trying to just you know ad lib the whole thing i'm like no, no, oh, no. like yeah let's not let's not you know there's all the ums and the in the likes as they as they try to remember stuff so yeah it would, it would trickle into that so storyboarding um videos which, you know, I'll be honest, kids don't like to do it. <laughs> you know, they right. don't like to do it. So then you kind of have to, you know, it begs a question of like, well, what am I assigning? Am I trying to teach them content or am I trying to teach them video production? And, you know, even in just planning a video, you know, if they spend all the time doing that storyboarding, the whole thing, um, putting in, you know, dialogue or putting in transition or, or talking about dialogue or putting in notes about content, well, you know, why don't we just accept that too as well? Like if they never get to the video, maybe in, the next video project there, they kind of understand the process a little bit, and then they can go on to the actual um, producing a video. Uh, presentations, it's another one. Oh. I mean, how many times do, <laughs> when you assign a presentation, you know, the first thing students will do is they open Google Slides, or they open pages, or not pages, a keynote, and, you know, it's typeface, and colors, and backgrounds, and Transitions, images. and the transitions. It's all about those transitions. <laughs> the animated transitions. We want the star wipe, folks. <laughs> yeah all the time so it's again it's like you're not you're, there's no content there's no like <laughs> message there's no so you know it, it started to go into that like how do i storyboard that how do i put ideas like i use sticky notes all the time or i use index cards when i plan presentations and using that just to get your ideas out and, and it was it was interesting i went to go work with a, um, a high school here in st louis um across this on the other side of the city and teaching kids how to use that, like how to use note cards and how to use sticky notes just to get ideas out about a presentation. And this one, this one student came up and he's like, you know what, thank you for doing this. I didn't realize that I could, I could do this. Like I, you know, this was a thing. He said, you know, when I would open their presentations, I always felt like I had to go in order of the slides. Like I'm on slide two, I'm on slide three, I'm on slide four. He said, this at least helps me put ideas out and then I can organize them into some type of order or some type of sequence. And I said, yeah, man, nobody, nobody, nobody told you you couldn't, but nobody told them how to do it to begin with. So, the, so when, I, when I talk about visual thinking and drawing, that's what I mean. I mean, like, how do I think through ideas? And, and, and sometimes you might get the image of, you know, the Googles and the Amazons and the Facebooks with their whiteboards and everything. I mean, it's essentially that. And it's coming up with different structures for different, um, you know, situations or thinking situations that students are in. Um, helping them understand which structure do I use? When do I use storyboarding? When do I use kind of mind mapping? When do I use, um, you know, uh, just a, a simple sketch for a prototype? So that's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, the other side of that is um, I do do sketch noting with kids. Um, so sketch noting being I'm consuming some kind of information somewhere. So I'm hearing it in a podcast. I'm hearing it on a video. I'm hearing it from a, a lecture. And then um, kind of processing that and creating some kind of image along with text to capture that. So that's the other side of that. That's 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 tougher in a lot of ways because um, it's tough because you're you're also having to teach listening skills, mm -hmm. which 
I'm, you know, I'm not the greatest at, and sometimes drawing just helps me focus. Uh, but th that's the big piece we, we forget about. So I, I want to start to spend some time in that coming up, you know, as you know, as, as I kind of move forward is what are some good listening strategies? Because it's, I can teach you how to draw all day. I can teach you how to write. I can teach you how to put pencil to paper. Um, but now I'm really, you know, thinking about well, what are some skills that I need to help me be a better listener? So then when I do go and write something or draw something or put this idea that somebody had um, on paper, I'm, I'm, I'm doing it more efficiently and effectively. Uh, the other side, you know, the other piece of sketch noting that I think can become intimidating is, you know, some of the great, the people who really do it really, really well, um, it looks really, really good, right? It looks beautiful. Um, it kind of crosses into artwork mm -hmm. at some point. And so um, I, I think there's a fine line. I think we have to make sure we we we, we talk about between with, with teachers and with students is that it, it's it's not meant to be artwork, even though I know I've done it as art and other people do do it as art. It's also just meant to be a way for you to capture ideas from other people in a way that makes sense to you. And, right. and sometimes those visuals help you remember, those visuals help you organize. Um, so it's a fine line, and, 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 and as teachers, you know, Google, well, what is sketchnoting? And they see that. Don't be so overwhelmed with it. No, you know, you're not going to, that is not where you start. That's kind of like uh, people who have done it for a while and can uh, kind of add the details to make it look really, really nice. Right. So, yeah, so I, and, you know, I think a lot of people, their first sort of foray into it or, or introduction to it was that those great UPS commercials from a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So the guy from the UPS commercials gets up, and, you know, he's standing and he's got long hair and he's like very, uh, very distinct looking. If you, you'd see him, you remember the commercial immediately. He's just in front of a whiteboard and he talks about UPS and delivery, oh. delivery strategies. And he's got the brown marker and he's drawing <laughs> things out. Right. And it's it's just like you watch him do it. and He's like and you're like, oh, oh, so that's what logistics is like. You hear the word logistics, like Amazon logistics all the time. Well, basically, it's how do they get stuff from, you know, the manufacturer to their warehouse to you as an individual, right? And this guy gets up and in 30 seconds explains this incredibly complicated process, and it's it's visual thinking. It, it is. That's so funny. I've never even referenced that commercial yet. I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. I, I'm going to have to put in a presentation, and I'm going to thank you for that. But <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It is all about like logistics. It, something with, with logistics can be very complex and very difficult to understand. And where is your role in that com, you know complex web of you know um, of, of a process? And I have a you know, and a great example for us is that we had distributed Chromebooks six, seven years ago. And, you know, we kind of like the day comes, we walk in, we're like, okay, Brandon, I need you to go to that table and put that over there. Okay. Um, Adam, I need you to go. And then I'm going to go do, and it's just kind of like some pointing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this, this exercise. And so when it goes and it happens, you know, you go back and like, no, 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 no. I didn't want you to put it there. I wanted you to put it here. And then I wanted this to be, so it was, you know, kind of a mess. And then we had somebody come in and who happened to be helping us with this, um, talk about that again and then they then she drew it out and she drew out like well why don't you draw it out so you know exactly where you're supposed to go and where you're supposed to be and what's supposed to happen yep. i was like huh something as simple as that like right. you know it's, yeah right we think it's going to waste time we think it's you know childish um you know we're adults we can do this without that no 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 it helps <laughs> we, we need that we need help we yeah need help. it helps I, I did i used to do a lesson on westward expansion and and right through where you live uh in in us us history one you know, how, how did the settlers go from, say, Independence, Missouri, right out to, to the West Coast? And, and, and what did that process look like? And I had the kids storyboard it on the board with the, and do the markers and then film it, you know, as they were drawing up on the board. It was a lot of fun. The kids liked it. Um, that was like the last class that I taught, taught before I moved to the tech position. And I look back at it and I think like, man, I, I had something going there. I, I could have we could have really made this like the next year I would have developed it even further. Uh, but it was definitely a fun lesson. For sure. I've got, I had a, um, same kind of, along the same kind of lines. I had an uh, AP lit teacher at the high school. Uh, I happened to walk into this class and, and I showed this picture in my slides. Uh, they were reading the great Gatsby and he had two or three kids that on their own said, we're having a hard time understanding and keeping up with kind of these talks about the book. Do you mind if we draw it? And, and every day they contributed, to this drawing, which became kind of a story map or kind of very much like the Westward expansion. And, you know, when it was said and done, <laughs> it was, it's a hot mess. I mean, there's just, you know, drawings everywhere. But so is that but book. Kid, 
right? Yeah, yeah, exa- exactly. You know? Yeah. And, 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 but the kids knew how that all went because they were there from the, from its inception, right. just like your kids were there from, you know, you know, the proclamation to cross the Appalachian mountains, like they were there. And then they, as it gets messier and messier, they were still right. there from the beginning. So they saw it grow. Right. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just amazing. And then seeing kids point to something once it's been erased, but yet they're pointing, you know, it's kind of a cool thing to see like, yeah. Oh Yeah. I remember when we bought, you know, bought this or there, you know, we crossed that or we went here. Or this was another, you know, that just shows that it just takes. And, then, and there's tons of research. I've looked up research on it and it's not even new research. It's research that's been out for quite some time about using drawing um, to, to help with memory. Um, and different, different studies have been done since then too as well. But I mean, it's a thing and it's not. I think what gets intimidating in Dan Rome um, is somebody, if, if you haven't had a chance to read Dan Rome, he wrote a book he's written a few books but he's got one called um back of the napkin and um draw to win and um he talks about that you know it's just you got to get past using drawing as an artistic process you you got to you got to start thinking about drawing as a a thinking process or a communicating process um and it really like makes sense it 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 does once you can get past that um and, and you know we do it too sometimes we just we don't mean using a pen or a pencil but we use our fingers to point maybe on the table, like, mm-hmm. okay, we're here and we're going to try to go here or we're doing this. Oops, sorry, my phone. Um, we still kind of do it. And, and so, um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's just fascinating to see kids gravitate towards it. And it's not for every kid. By any right. means, it is not for every kid. Just like, you know, Cornell notes, bulleted you know, oh. Roman numeral notes are yeah. not for everybody either, yeah. but they're for some people. That's right. great. Um, so it's like, just another strategy. Yeah, like if you grew up playing sports, at some point you sat down with a coach and they had a clipboard and they're drawing out the play on it. They're not saying, okay, you move, you know, 35 feet straight. And then you take a 90 degree turn to the right. Um, and you put your stick down and you accept the pass as you're coming across the blue line. And then you turn another 70 degrees straight, you know, like th- that's not happening. It just doesn't exist because visual thinking is so much easier Right? It so is. You're exactly. Did we talk about this once before? I don't, you and I. I don't know. I know yeah, we've t- I mean, we've t- that's we've a talked. Great analogy. About, we've talked once before about about visual thinking, but like you wouldn't ever. I mean, so we're watching. My wife and I are watching the um the Queen's Gambit right now, right? Uh-huh. Uh On Netflix, and it's unbelievable. If you haven't seen it, I, I started watching it. Yep. Yeah. So, and for the people that are listening, it's a great watch. So, the one thing that gets me is that as they play, they're writing notes about all of their moves and thinking about like you can go back and look at it in the same way that you could like a baseball score, uh, you know, a scorecard in baseball and say like batter by batter, pitch by pitch, you can see exactly what happened. And same thing with, with that, but to look at that versus to watch them play. I mean, you look at the level of engagement, you think about that with your students, like you watch um, Beth Harmon sit down to play chess and it's like entertainment because right. of how it's happening, how quick they're moving and everything else and the slamming the clock and everything. But to then have to go through that score sheet, it, you don't, you, <laughs> there's nothing, you lose all of that emotion. You lose all of that like excitement, you know? Um, oh, for sure. For sure. That's another great analogy too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, sports. Yeah, definitely. Like sports and NHS, you know, you wouldn't just verbally describe that or verbally give those directions. You having that, to look at, to know exactly what I'm supposed to do and, and when. Um, it's amazing. It's, I don't know why it doesn't translate to other, right. into other things. And I mean, in sports are, sports are kind of our great equalizer as far as like learning goes, right? There's no, you know, everybody goes out on the court and they perform or they go on the field and they perform, but there's not like a, I don't, you, you sit down and, and everything is simplified. Like everybody, you speak the language of the person that's in front of you and they understand you and you work with them until they understand you. Right. And then the, the final exam is the actual game itself. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. And I think, I think it lends itself well to visual thinking, but um, you are also all over social media. Like <laughs> your social media game is strong and uh, you've, you've been able to take your, uh, your love for illustrating and, um, and, and your ability to use visual thinking and learning, um, but th- to translate that in, into your website, manueldraws.com, and, and your Twitter and Instagram, uh, but have turned those into te- into books. Yeah, it's it's been a really, a really fun kind 
kind of little journey that I've been on. Um, you know, we were kind of talking about it earlier, but I, I've always drawn. Like, it's just something I've just been, you know, it was a passion as a kid. My parents were really supportive of, you know, buying me all the things and, you know, markers, pens, pencils, paper, whatever, whatnot. Um, but it was never something that I was, it was ever communicated to me as like, you can do this for a living. It was more of like, don't do this. Hmm. You'll never make money. You'll be the, you know, the starving artist, if you will. Um, so, I mean, you know, I, it's still, I do it here and there. Um, but when I got back into education, when I got into education, um, and started working with kids, you know, the past, you know, 10 years or so, I kind of started to draw a little more, just kind of therapeutic. I was kind of at that point, you know, this is my 18th year. So I was probably halfway, I was like 10 years into it or something like that. And, you know, just therapy <laughs> for, you know, just being a teacher, being an educator. Um, and then, you know, I, I had a friend tell me, you know, these are great. And, you know, she was an artist and designer. And so like, I really respected that and uh, her opinion, you know, it's different. And I always thought, you know, you, you get imposter syndrome a lot, you know, oh, as, yeah. as, as an artist designer, um, in and tech, I'm sure in a lot of careers in technology, right? Like, yeah, for, for sure. There's always someone who's going to know more or be better. Right. 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 And you're kind of always like, well, I don't, I'll never, I'll never be at that point. Right. And so. Yeah, a good friend of mine, um, Rebecca Hare. Um, you know, she, like I said, designer, artist, kind of said, you know, these are these are good. Like, you you really have a talent. And so, hearing somebody who has those kind of you know quote unquote qualifications, um, and I was like, okay, cool. Like, all right, I'll take that. And so, slowly started to post some things in addition to what I was doing with kids. So, um, it just it kind of got noticed. You know, whether it was just friends or you know friends that from my childhood they're like oh yeah i remember you used to draw these look great and then kind of you know different teachers i would work with and i guess you know in a sense I had a following i mean i didn't really realize it was a, a following of people that wanted you know wanted to see things and people have asked like hey can you draw this or can you do this you know just for fun and i did it and um it was great i got more confident in doing it i actually have to resist the urge to post <laughs> you know some of my drawings and you know, it's, it, I, I started to realize like the more I post, the better I got. And, you know, I, I, I listen to different podcasts and um, YouTube uh, videos on with illustrators. And it is like, the more you post, the better you get. You just, you just do like, because you're just practicing, you're right. just continuing practicing. And so that eventually led to, um, an, I mean, a, a publisher uh, reaching out and actually it was an individual first and reached out to illustrate a book. And it, Micah Shippey, um, who was with Learn Ready Learner One, uh, had reached out and said, "Hey, man, I, I knew you were doing drawings. Like, I love your stuff. You know, I saw it. he was a, he was one of our mentors at Google Innovator in California, and he said we're writing a book, man, and I'd love to have you illustrate it. <laughs> and so I was like, wow, that'd be yeah. really cool, right? Like that was like, okay, I can do this. And then panic set in. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how <laughs> how this works. What do you mean? Right. It was a great idea, but then when you know the rubber meets the road, it's like all right, how do I illustrate a book? Um, and so I had a couple of friends who were illustrators, a couple of friends who were designers, um, a lot of YouTube videos on, you know, what, do you, how do you do this? Yeah. What do you, you know, it's different, it's different than just drawing on my iPad and a piece of paper, snapping a picture and posting it. So it was a big learning curve, it was a big learning process. So, um, finished that book, got it put out. Um, it was a lot of spot, spot illustrations. So it wasn't like a full, you know, um, page for page kind of thing. Uh, but it caught the attention of another publisher, um, Edu Match Books, and they reached out to me and said, "Hey, we've we've heard about you. We've seen your work. Would you mind us listing you as an illustrator on our website? We have authors who are wanting to, who need illustrators for children's books." I'm like, well, of course, sure. Um, probably a week later, I had um, Betsy O'Neill Sheehan, who's there in Massachusetts, um, reached out and said, "Hey, you know, I've got a children's book. I'd like for you to illustrate. What do you?" What do you think? And I was like, sure, let's set up a call. We did, you know, everything was great. And, you know, we started it and, and even more panic set in because <laughs> now, now I'm, I'm conceptualizing in a whole, an entire story that Betsy had created about this character. You know, she, she definitely had some, she had some um, sketches that she had done of what she kind of thought she wanted it to look like and which definitely helped. But yeah, I got so in. Um, I gotta think we, that. We, I gotta imagine that's tough. Like the to for you to have to as the illustrator get into the mind of the author. Like, I, like I think of like a, um. So you get like J.K. Rowling writes Harry Potter, right? And she has in her mind a sense of what Harry Potter looks like and what Dumbledore looks like and what 
you know, every last little character and, you know, um, magical creature, she has it all up here. And then she says it to someone and they have to say, okay. And they have to try and create something and say like, well, here's what I was thinking. And that process must be interesting. You know, it was, it goes back to kind of visual thinking again. You know, I, you know, I, Betsy and I talked and, you know, we, we really seem to be on, on the same page just in our kind of like communicating back and forth. So it was kind of easy to kind of pick her brain and she was very descriptive. And um, I, I, I took all that information and, and to the best of my ability, kind of drew these kind of thumbnail sketches, quick sketches of ideas for Aggie, the main character. And I don't know, I think I sent her, I don't know, five or six versions of that character. Uh, wearing different clothes, wearing different, um, you know, outfits, different styles. And we kind of just had some back and forth. She's like, this is great. Can we do this? Can we do this? And it was great. It was really good back and forth. Like Betsy made it very easy. I didn't feel pressure. Um, so if that's my first experience, I hope they are all like that. If I can continue to do this. Um, and so, you know, it's funny at the last minute, I sent her, I sent her all of these, um, sketches of what I wanted, you know, what I thought she was wanting with the main character. And at the last minute, um, I said, you know what, I'm going to add something to this character. And so I added the hat that is actually on the character. And I, <laughs> I added it kind of as an afterthought, like just, I mean, literally before I sent it, um, one of the sketches, I added a hat and it was, it was a hat, like a stocking hat that my, my kids wore. So my oldest had this blue stocking hat with these little kind of bug eyes on the top. And, and a tongue sticking out. And so I was like, oh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to draw that. And my younger one, my younger son wears it now. Um, so I drew it and, you know, Betsy's son loved it. And she's like, no, we're going to, I love the hat. I'm like, wow. Like yeah. it was just kind of a cool, cool thing that I got to put in the book. Yeah. Um, that was something that, you know, for my, for my family or for my, my history. Um, so it was fun. It was just nerve wracking to, put such large illustrations, backgrounds, spreads, you know, that was, like, am I doing this right? <laughs> what, yeah. You know, it, 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 was, it was a fun, it was fun. Like, again, I, I'm glad I had people that I could contact and some people I could talk to that kind of helped me through that, which was absolutely great. Right. Um, and, then, and, and then that led to the, another book. I had another book um, recently, say, uh, Ready Learner One had released another book on e-gaming, um, the esports playbook we just released and again more spot spot illustrations and these all had to be in black and white so that was a you know a oh, challenge wow. to try to create such these characters in a black and white yeah you know book so is that yeah, because, is that of, because of the printing or is that be, the way they're going to go to press or was that a, a choice it, it's just how it was going to be that was just the the book was going to be printed in black and white mm -hmm. there was no no color because it was a full you know larger book it wasn't okay. like a kid's book um i know their costs and that stuff yeah time. yeah but yeah so they, they released that um just a couple of weeks ago or actually about a month ago they just released that book so that was kind of cool so i've got you know three books that i've put out yeah. that are, have been, or have been put out with some of my work in it which is a really cool like kind of childhood dream kind of thing that got to happen and then it was totally by you know I, mean, I, I kind of by accident, kind of, you know, the hustle was definitely there, you know, after, once the accident happened and I was posting and sharing and, um, you know, that hustle paid off. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about it. And so I have to tone it down sometime because, you know, then I go back to talking about drawing, you know, simple figures, <laughs> figures with teachers. And so um, it's nice to have both ends of kind of that spectrum of drawing of really, really detailed art artistic work. And then going back to like, nope, let's keep it simple. Right. That's all it has to be. One marker. That's all you need kind of thing. Yeah. And I think the, te the teacher brain has that, right? That being able to differentiate. Who, For the, sure. Looking at who your audience is and being able to understand that. Um, so what do you have on the horizon coming up? Oh, man. Um, I, I just, another publisher reached out uh, about uh, potential illustrating another book. So we've got, a, I got a phone call. Then we set up, we were setting up a phone call to talk about another children's book i believe this one is so that's exciting um and then a couple of conferences i've got um you know we got mass q coming up and then i have um stem teacher yeah stem teacher conference um that's coming up in january january 2nd i believe and that's mm -hmm. with um adam and carly oh what is their last name they're gonna kill me if i don't remember their last name i just know them as adam and carly on <laughs> on um on instagram and, and twitter 
uh, they have a conference coming up, which is really cool because they reached out originally for me to illustrate their logo for their conference. Oh, cool. Um, so that's kind of neat, kind of getting into into that world of illustrating graphics for conferences. So I even got a T-shirt and a coffee mug with my art on it. Oh, neat. Me, uh, yeah. So which was awesome. That's, you know, little things like that are just, you know, it's fun. It's cool. I mean, it's, yeah, it's fun. It's, I'm having a blast doing all this. So. Yeah, yeah. That's what I have coming up. You know, that's as far as that work goes. Pandemic is definitely a little, you know, a little tough. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> I'm but, learning to definitely, you know, do virtual, uh, virtual sessions and, and whatnot. Right. So, yeah, I think about what what we've learned, you know, when we go back some years from now and say, like, what did we learn from this? Um, you know, one of the things I think about is like people like Mo Willems made themselves so accessible online like people instantly became incredibly accessible and and you know the, the audience was able to meet them where they were um you know how how we really showed how powerful and connected we are as a society uh like i look at like a, a website like cameo um like being able All to right. just say like like we had my friend's bachelor party we did a virtual bachelor party and we got terry francona who was the red sox manager when they won the world series did a cameo, wow. did a cameo for us like for his bachelor party he's a huge baseball fan it was like the coolest thing ever like we had a personalized message from the guy that broke the curse right sorry st louis guy i apologize um, <laughs> no, that's okay I'm, i grew up in texas oh, okay so, all, right, you know. all right yeah oh that's right and you guys have won plenty since then but um the, <laughs> and it's funny to think like the guy who the apparently the highest earning guy on uh, on cameo is brian um Baumgartner, the, the guy that played kevin from the office like really he's made millions on cameo wow he's got like you're a, kidding me. a full-on second career as like you know like it's kevin from the office on cameo it's crazy it's a, it's, a, it's amazing what we'll pay for yeah. I know, this, <laughs> this, my wife told me the soup nazi from seinfeld makes six figures a year on cameo like wow who would have thought right um but here we that's are that's insane right right Oh man, I'm in the wrong. Well, I'm not famous enough, so but, you know, maybe one one day I'll become famous enough that somebody will want to, somebody will care to have me on there. I don't know to pay for you know a round of drinks. That I'll be happy would, with that. that. And right, who wouldn't be? Um, yeah. So, thank you again for coming on, um, connecting with us, and we can find you on Twitter at Manuel Herrera 33, as well as Instagram ManuelDraws.com is your website. Anything else yes. you'd like to like to sh- say to the people, our listeners? You know. You know, this is this, I need a, I need advice and a help, and um, I just bought a cricket machine. I don't oh, know if you know what a cricket machine yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I just bought one of those, and so now I'm trying to figure out how to like combine that with my art oh. and and come up with something. And so, uh, if anybody out there who's listening to the podcast has any ideas uh, for crickets uh, <laughs> and art and creating things, okay. please let me know. Please send them my way. Um, you know, it's like drinking from a water hose when I go online and look, it's oh, just yeah. way, it's way too much. It's way right. too much. I need somebody to like weed out some of that stuff for me so I can, uh, I can figure that out. Right. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that I got the names right. It's Carly and Adam. Uh, they're at Carly and Adam, uh, for their STEM conference. I didn't want to, their, their last name is not even on there. That's probably why I couldn't remember. That makes it. sense. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so um, that's it. I mean, help me with my cricket, please. Somebody, you can come <laughs> to my session and tell me. Maybe I'll have some giveaways uh, at the session. So That's great. All right, Manuel, thank you so much for coming <laughs> on the podcast. And I'm sure we will talk to you again soon. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brandon. Take care, man. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Anchor, and anywhere podcasts can be found. This is the Get a Q podcast from MassQ, here to educate, connect, and inspire.